Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today, guys, today I'm going to be reviewing Boosh, Tyranny of Faith by Richard Swan. And this is book two in the Empire of the Wolf uh, trilogy. I want to thank Orbit and the author for the advanced copy that I was very, very privileged to read. And man, 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 was it a good one. So I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's get down to business. And let's talk about what I think about Tyranny of Faith. Is it as good as book one? I am here to tell you that yes, yes, it is just as good, if not better than book one. This picks up very, very shortly after the end of, uh, of Justice of Kings. And uh, please understand that there's going to be spoilers for Justice of Kings. So if you haven't read Justice of Kings, uh, you probably shouldn't be watching a, a, a review of the second book. This does pick up very, very soon after the end of Justice of Kings. And where Justice of Kings took place a lot in the, uh, in the, like the, the outskirts of the Empire, what I really like about Tyranny of Faith is that it, the setting is completely different. Almost all of the book takes place in Sova, which is the, uh, you know, basically Rome. It's, it's the main uh, city of the Empire. And from the beginning, I can tell you that if you liked uh, the voice of Helena in, uh, in the first book, you will love it here as well. Helena has such a fresh voice and... Uh, such she's not quite jaded or cynical the way the way her uh, adult companions are her very very youthful and not really naive but not yet not yet like beaten down and crushed by the world voice even though she did have a traumatic past Helena is just really a breath of fresh air uh, hearing her tell the story because again it is first person told from an unspecified future time where Helena is you know like in her 70s or whatever recalling these events and just right away Swan has delivered with the camaraderie between these four individuals. We've got Von Vault, we've got Radomir, uh, the you know the small town sheriff who joined them after the after the end of uh, the the first book, and we've got Bresinger who only has one arm, and then of course Helena the scribe, and the interaction between them, especially the interaction between the three who are not Von Vault. Um, Bresinger, Radomir, and Helena is so good. Like, it would have been easy to have Bresinger and Radomir kind of feel very samey, but they do not feel that way at all. They feel very, very different. Uh, Radomir especially develops into one of my favorite characters. Radomir feels like your crass friend who lives in the sticks that you invited. He feels like the country mouse that you've invited to the city, and he just embarrasses you at the dinner party that you're having with the governor. And it's just really funny the way he he interacts in the way he's just like, I don't understand why we're doing this bullcrap. When everyone else is like, dude, dude, Vladimir, we are in public. Would you stop it? You're embarrassing us. And again, Helena's voice is just perfect for this particular story, especially as we grapple with um, the enormity of Sova as a city and the different districts and just the huge buildings. I've seen, you know, some people be like, well, this, the book was slow to start because it, it you know, talks about architecture or whatever. I mean, it, it does, but that's not, the story doesn't slow down to do that. And it, I think it's required from Helena's perspective to see just how, like, kind of out of her depth she is. She's never been to a city this large, the, the largest city in the world that governs the largest empire in the world. It really does give a sense of scale with the kind of story that uh, Swan is telling here. Sova really does feel like lived in, and it's, Sova really does feel like a living, breathing city with a history. It feels lived in. Uh, some of his descriptions of the, in a lot of times in these large cities, you don't really get like how natural nasty they can be sometimes, and so Swan doesn't shy away from the descriptions of the, the kind of like tradesman parts of town that have, you know, that smell like pee and, you know, that are really, really gross. And then you've got like the senatorial part of town that is much, much better taken care of because, you know, those guys are the important ones. And it's important to note the scale of Sova because the kind of scale of this story is, is much larger than the one we have in Justice of Kings. But there is still a, an investigation that is central to uh, the narrative while not being its entire focus. Remember, they're having to deal with, with Claver and the nonsense that, that he's engaged in with stealing the Justice's powers and uh, using them for his own nefarious purposes, you know, like taking over the Templars and you know, working actively against the Emperor and the Empire. And the Von Vault we see here, we continue to see the struggles that Von Vault has. We continue to see kind of the cracks that Von Vault is experiencing based on the events of the first books that kind of like brought those to the forefront. And it's really 
interesting and kind of hard sometimes to watch from Helena's point of view, this guy, this man who has taken her in and whom she idolizes and holds on a pedestal really above everyone else. She thinks that he is flawless, that he is without fault. And we don't really think about what kind of like pressure that can put on a person when you think that this person literally can do no wrong. But that's kind of the pressure that she puts on Von Vault and watching their relationship kind of grow and develop as Helena learns like, has he, has he always been this way? Has he really kind of like lost his way or does he still have it? Just it's not quite what she thought it was. The explorations of justice and the law and when you adhere to it, if law has to be the same for every single person for justice to be done. Those kind of explorations and Helena's response to it is some of the most interesting uh, dynamics and uh, character development in, in the novel. I mean, Helena already gets like super cheesed anytime anyone even begins to criticize uh, Von Vol. And Bressinger's kind of like that too because they all owe, I guess, like, they owe a bunch to Von Vol. But Radomir's just like, what are y'all's problem? Like, y'all know, y'all know he's just a dude, right? Right? Like, that he can he can be wrong sometimes. Like, no, he can never be wrong. We love him too much. And that kind of thing. And so the, the team trying to uh, get the emperor to give them aid in stopping uh, what they believe to be the, the, the largest threat, Claver, it's interesting to watch the emperor feel differently about that particular situation because he is the emperor of the largest empire in the world and he has a lot of problems not just one insane priest in the frontier land that, you know, Von Vault thinks is the biggest threat. And so you're just screaming, like, what are you doing, dude? Like, like, please listen to them. But you, I mean, you also understand that this dude's the emperor. He's not, he's not Von Vault, you know, he's not, he hasn't seen Claver. You know, he, like, I don't understand why he should feel that this one priest is more important than this huge war he's got out east in the frontier. And so we see Von Vault and we see them interact with, with the Senate and the, and the different factions in it. And the investigation side is, is my favorite part. I'm not going to kind of give away what, what the mystery is because it comes in, you know, it doesn't start with a mystery the way um, that Justice of Kings does. So it comes part way in, but I love the mystery and I love the reveals. And I love that, that Swan leaves enough to where you could figure it out, but it's not just so signposted that it's very, very obvious because it's not. But I love the exploration of justice. And if you've watched my channel for any length of time, you know that uh, explorations of justice are, uh, justice is one of the things that's most important to me in my life. And this this idea that of the equal application of the law. But this book asks the questions, are there certain crimes that require different extenuating circumstances for the law? For example, treason, actual treason, not you're talking bad about the, the emperor, but you're like, like actual treason, like you're trying to, literally trying to bring the empire crashing down. That's treason. Should those laws be different? Should people's rights be suspended for those particular crimes? If the law does not apply to everyone equally, is it really justice? But is it also is it also justice to apply the law equally, knowing that these people are going to take advantage of it and use the the goodwill that the law gives them, you know, like a like a trial and 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 a chance to plead their case, knowing that they're going to spread this poisonous, toxic rhetoric that is objectively a danger to the Empire, is it still okay if you don't give them the same rights as these other people under the law? And I think the answer is probably different in fiction than it is in real life, but it's just difficult because you desperately want the law to be suspended for these terrible people because they don't deserve it because they're awful and they're bad guys. But at the same time, if you admire Von Vault, like, can you... Like, can you really justify it? It's uh, it's just so good, it's so good. What will cause people to uh, compromise their principles, their belief in the law? What good is truth when you're the only one playing by the rules and uh, you're the only one that cares or values, cares about or values the truth when no one else is playing by the, by the rules, no one else gives a crap about the law. How can you then, how can you still defend the empire by defending the law when people are knowingly 
flaunting it and not giving a crap and using that to bring down the empire from the inside. It's it, like, how do you do? What's the right answer? The, the right answer is that you get a dictator who you knows who you knows has the uh, the best interest of uh, of everyone and the the health of the of the empire like at heart and not like power hungry. And then you know he just goes in and you know off of their head, off of their head, off of their head. That's really what it is. But we got to find a character that we know that we can trust to do that. And I'm not sure the Emperor of Sova is that guy. Uh, Swan also explores the danger of um, of populist rhetoric. People who use the 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 Senate and the, the, the benefit of their position to spread things that they know are not true, uh, just to say it long enough and loud enough. And this reminds me of, of Demosthenes, uh, who did this literal thing to Philip of Macedon back in the, you know, the 300 BC, where Demosthenes would literally turn Athens against Philip, even when it wasn't in their best interest, because he would just say lies loud enough and long enough until the Athenians began to believe him. And that did not work super well uh, for Athens at the time. But, you know, Demosthenes was, you know, the ultimate demagogue. And so there's also a lot of discussion about the letter of law and the spirit of law. And just like we saw this in real at the very beginning of the first book where Von Vault spares those, those, the, the, the villagers in real, even though they were pagans and should have been, you know, should have been sentenced to death like Claver wanted him to. He just kind of let it slide because the spirit of law is not really there to like kill peasants who aren't really doing anything wrong. But Claver wanted the letter of the law applied there. And so here again, we have uh, that that exploration of just because the law says that you can, does it mean that you should? And that's always that's always one of my favorite arguments from Jurassic Park. You you were so concerned on whether or not you could, you never stopped to think of whether or not you should. Uh, and so Swan really, really delves into that here as well. Now, it cannot be understated how surprising and fascinating the horror aspects of this book are. We, we experienced a little bit of that in the first book with the, with the necromancy scene. There's significantly more horror aspects, so much so that, like, it really spooked me reading this at night. There is a thing in this book that you will know it as soon as you get to it that is genuinely, genuinely horrifying. And just this kind of cosmic horror elements that Swan throws in. He's very, very exceptional at writing these things and just evoking these kind of primal fears within us as humans. And it's just the specificity with which uh, Swan writes from the from the details of of Sova that show us that you know it has this kind of distinguished veneer that really just kind of covers up its own selfishness to the fact that Von Vault is like really dainty when it comes to smells like he can't deal with things that smell bad even though he's this great fencer and you know fighter that can kill people and bloods everywhere and he's been on battlefields but like he doesn't like the smell of like the butcher district like these little details and we see these also in the the conversation between between Bresinger and uh, Helena and Radomir, who are often by themselves because Von Vault, you know, is in his main city where his main employer is, so he's off doing crap a lot. And so they have a bunch of time to interact, and there's just really specific details and interactions that really make these characters feel, th feel real, feel three-dimensional, and really, really elevates the writing, I think. Uh, really, really good storytelling here. Exciting. The, like, last section of this book, and, you know, I've been saying this a lot, but there's been a lot of, like, final acts, just, like, spirals to the finish. Oh, when everything starts to unravel and, and you start to realize everything is happening, and, like, I cannot wait for book three. It is too long between now and book three. I had hoped that it would be out uh, next month in March, I was told that it will not be. It will be next year, which is far too long to wait. There are many surprises in this book. A lot of times the narrative goes a different way than uh, standard fantasy convention would say that it should go or normally does go. And, oh, I love that. I would send I would send uh, the author uh, a, a direct message being like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad it didn't do this thing that I anticipated it doing and did this other thing instead. It goes in some surprising directions and leaves us in a surprising state of affairs uh, toward the end. It is very, very good. It's very, very good. So, so I love this book. It is just as good as the first one. They are very different. It's hard for me to decide which one I like better because I, I tend to like when things are kind of like smaller and more intimate in, in scope. But at the same time, we get a lot of these intimate moments with his, Von Vault's three companions. So, 
they are even in quality. They are both both excellent. On the Kingfin approval system, I give Tyranny of Faith a superb all day long. Uh, probably a superb plus. I give it a superb plus all day long. Really, really good. Out of five stars, five stars easily. Uh, one of my favorite reads of the month. Great way to start off the year. Guys, that is it for me for today. Thank you again to Richard Swan and to Orbit and to NetGalley for the advanced copy. Um, I also have an interview with Richard Swan that I will be coming out probably closer to when the book is out, probably the day the book comes out. Be on the lookout for that. Um, that will be a little bit uh, more of a spoiler chat where we talk about, well, we also talk about the Krogan from Mass Effect, but we delve even deeper into some of the things that I can't talk about here in this review before the book comes out. Uh, so we delve into, into that kind of stuff. We'll talk about military logistics, as we always do. Richard's just such a wonderful guy, so pleasant to talk to. So guys, have you read Tyranny of Faith yet? Are you waiting with bated breath on pins and needles, if you will, to be able to snag this when it comes out on Valentine's Day? There is no better gift to give your Valentine than Tyranny of Faith. So go and pre-order to this. If you haven't already, I'll put a link down in the description where you can pre-order that. I definitely, definitely buy it. Highly recommend. That is it for me for today. As always, guys, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the description, and I'll see you next time, guys.